Welcome back to the Giants, guys. We've got wide receiver Alex Bachman joining the show this week. He's talking about his story as an undrafted free agent, all the way to impressing at Giants camp. Stay tuned and follow these guys on Twitter. Yep, you got it. Back, right? Another episode of the Giants guy. And who am I? I'm the host that you love. And you still haven't gotten sick of me because why? I bring you the best entertainment week after week. Uh, owner operator of nygiantsrush.com, all that crazy good content that's up there. Um, and today, of course, I promised you some offensive insight. Alex Bachman in the room. What's up, Alex? What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, definitely, no doubt. We're gonna be pumping this out on YouTube. Um, and uh, everybody's been kind of jazzed that we're gonna get some some offensive insight. But let's let's. Let's um, let's he's start. the real AB, by the way. A lot of people think it's Antonio Brown, it's actually him. And I just I like that. Set, <laughs> I, right. I wanted to or, set the record I straight. I like that. Or, or can we go AB2 or no? No, he's the AB. <laughs> all right, I don't know who fine. Antonio Brown is, but that's fine. Okay, I'm all, I'm all for it. Which, by the way, will bring me to something later. We were talking about about the number that he wears, so we get into <laughs> that too. So, um, all right, Alex, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, Let's start off with this. You're a California guy. You come across the entire United States to play at Wake Forest, right? And now you find your way up the coast to the Giants. First question I have is, how do you get from California to Wake Forest? Because Wake Forest is beautiful. I love it. You know, um, uh, m- my daughter was was looking at it. So how does a California guy get to Wake Forest? I mean, was that like a dream school or it was like, you like the coach? Like, how'd you get there? <clears throat> yeah, I was just trying to get as far away from my parents as possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, so I actually grew up a Florida State fan. My mom went to FSU. Um, so Florida State football was on every Saturday in the fall. And um, so I grew up a huge fanatic. I used to wake up to the war chant and my alarm clock every day. And, uh, I, yeah, and I used to, I used to, uh, I made a promise to myself that I would never go to any school that competed against Florida State. And, um, oh, out, of res- out of respect, you know. <laughs> out of respect yeah. for mom? All right, yeah, that's cool. Like, I mean, I just couldn't do it. I was, I was a huge fanatic. I couldn't imagine, you know. Um, I went to the national championship when they played Auburn. I was there on the 50-yard line, going you know, crazy. Awesome. Um, but I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the typical high school experience the most I think guys that at least make it to the National Football League had. Um, I didn't play any offense uh, until my senior year. I wanted to play offense. Um, I didn't really have a whole lot of help from the coaches. I I don't know. I wouldn't say – I don't know. I would say they didn't have a whole lot of belief in me on offense. I don't know what it was. Um, What were you playing, like like corner or safety? I was was safety. I was a safety, free safety. Um, But I had grown up – like learning how to play the receiver position. Like I just, I was a technician. I knew the game inside and out. Um, it was where I was comfortable, but they just didn't want to use me there for whatever reason. Um, you were so, too fast, I, probably. Or, or, or they said the opposite, which I, I was like, <laughs> all right. And they never timed me in a 40 or anything like that. But, um, you know, they took one look at me and I guess just made an assumption. But um, so I, I played safety my junior year. Um, Chris Claiborne was our linebackers coach, um, Buckus Award winner from USC. And yep. he had a seven on seven team. And uh, so I kind of took things into my own hands, figured if I was going to get help, then just had to go out and do it on my own. Um, so I asked to be part of a seven on seven team. He saw the talent I had, I asked to play receiver. And he's like, yeah, I mean, if you can compete and get open, then we'll love to have you. And it was all four star, five star guys on the team, guys had offers from everywhere. And then there was just me. Um, Caleb Wilson was our backup quarterback. We all, he, he ended up changing the tight ends. Okay. Uh, you know, and we had some other guys. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. Um, John Houston went to USC, um, Brandon Burton. A lot of guys, you know, were highly recruited, but it kind of fell off. Devon Monster was one of our quarterbacks. Um, I'm trying to think who went lead from us um i don't want to come on top of my head but we had some guys uh highly competitive and so i just had my dad film me in all our seven on seven tournaments okay. i go to these under armor rivals nike camps 
and uh, do one-on-ones, find out who these kids were based off the little numbers that they were on their shirts, find out what offers they had, and then me just beat them. Um, and we kind of made a highlight tape off that. And I think Great. you could just I like tell. That. What, I could think you could just tell, even though I didn't have pads on, that I knew what I was doing. Um, I had a good concept of the game offensively, how to get open. And uh, so we just started sending to schools. And, and I think the ideal fit for me was a school that I wanted to get a good degree. I understood that, you know, I could easily blow out my knee or something like that in college and football doesn't last forever. And I wanted to, um, to have a, at least a backup, um, some form of education, uh, good education that to rely on. And um, I also wanted a small school where my teacher knew my name. A lot of kids don't want that. They want the lecture halls or anything. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. class, but I wanted my teacher to know my name. I can't, I, I'm mad ADD. I can't focus in a room of 500 people. I can't, just can't do it. Same. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the ideal fit for me was a lot of schools that were on the East Coast. Um, okay. Stanford was on the West Coast, but they don't really throw the ball that much. So I wasn't going to really look there. But Vanderbilt, you know, Duke, even like the D1AA's like Wofford, Furman. Sure. A lot of schools in those areas. So we, so we sent that film out um, and I ended up going out there. I hadn't actually signed the wake. We we happened to be stopped driving past wake, and my dad asked me if I wanted to stop in. No, wait, wait. So you were it wasn't like on the radar. You were driving by, and we're like, hey, let's pull in to check it out. At Duke, Furman, Vanderbilt, wake wasn't on there. Wow. Cause... So I hadn't sent my phone to them. All right. Um, and uh, I we're driving past, and I'm kind of tired. My dad's like, yo, you want to stop by wake? I said, no. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> and uh, he's like, he's like, you sure? And I thought to myself, I was like, you know what? I don't want to burn any bridges before they even built. So um, I showed up on their campus. They had an intern that came up and met me. His name's Taylor Red. He's now a, he works in the sky department for the Patriots now. Okay. Um, but he was just an intern at the time, like probably 23 years old, something like that. And uh, he showed me around the campus. He's like, yeah, like, you know, send us your film or whatever. And I... He told, I found this afterwards, like, if you come into the office, they don't know who you are, they haven't heard of you, they probably won't watch your film, because if they haven't heard of you, then you're probably not anybody you sure. know, significant. Um, but my receiver co coach happened to have five minutes out of his day to take a look at it, and I'm driving to, I think, Wofford, we get a call, yo, you gotta come back. No! You know? Like, literally, like, like, turn around and come back? Yeah, you gotta turn around and come back. We're, we're on our way to Wofford, uh, we'll come back tomorrow, whatever. It's like, alright. So come back tomorrow, meet all the coaching staff. And they're like, yo, we, we got to have kind of filming pads or we got to see you live. And so I didn't really have any filming pads. I had zero catches to my name on the varsity level at that point going into my senior year. And then um, so I knew I had to go to camp. So I signed up for their camp. I signed up for Vanderbilt's camp. I had a good meeting with Vanderbilt. And I this go is there. The this is all in the summertime? I'm yeah, guessing. all the summer going into my senior year. Um, go there. I knew they were going to time me in the 40. I trained. I went down to prolific athletes. They trained guys for the 40. I knew they trained, trained Johnny Menzel. And where on the street was, the Johnny Menzel came in running a 4.9 and at the combine ran a 4.5. So I went down there, mimicked their workout, took it out to my garage uh, up in Thousand Oaks and just did that for two, three months. Went out there, ran a good 40, caught everything. Won every one on one, one, every one -on -one that I could until it got rained out, lightning came, camp got washed. Okay. And then, and then I went to Vanderbilt and I was on the front page of their rivals page whatever interview after the game after the, that's awesome after the camp and so that kind of verified that you know wake wasn't the only school that was on my radar and then two weeks later wake pulled the trigger i love the coaching staff i thought they were genuine like the campus it was beautiful and yeah. the style of school fit me perfectly they were also kind of struggling at that point i knew i can come in and compete and at least have a, an opportunity to get on the field earlier than later and um and that's what ended up happening for me so that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's good stuff, man. Story. I love hearing about the journey. I love hearing about that kind of stuff. Yeah, especially yeah. when the journey is, I don't really want to go, okay, we'll stop by. Oh, wait, they want me to turn around and come back. You know, that's yeah. that don't happen every day. To be honest, yeah. my favorite part of the story is how you looked up who you were going against in the seven-on-seven seven yeah. league, finding yeah. out who these dudes were, and then, like, highlighting that. Be like, yeah, I just beat him. He's going there. Just yeah. beat him. He's gone yeah, there. Like, guy's, dude, that's smart. Going like, to North Carolina, I smoked him. Yeah, this like, if, going to Florida State, I smoked yeah. him. Yeah, like, if people aren't yeah. recruiting you, like, recruit yourself and like put your tape yeah. out there. I like that, man. Exactly. Creative. And it, and and it sounds like, uh, sounds like your dad and your mom are, you know, 
uh, great support system too. So that's pretty cool. Huge, super grateful for them. I wouldn't be anywhere close to where I am today without them. So that's who awesome. were who were you a fan of growing up? That you like? What players did you try to like model emulate, your game after? Emulate, yeah. Um, I mean, in the league at the time was like Steve Smith. Um, guys that when I'm younger, I just like watching football. I wasn't at the point where I was like really like, like I think studying, studying guys. Man. But I think when yeah. I got to high school, to be honest, Victor Cruz was like one of the guys that Bang. I remember. I remember specifically because you can't wear single digits in the NFL if you're a receiver. And I remember seeing this guy, he's wearing three. And I was kind pre-season, of confused. Yeah. It was preseason. It was preseason though. <laughs> and I'm like, this guy's rocking three. And then he started bowling. And I was like, like, wow, this guy, no one's even heard of him and he's balling. And then uh, my act- my uh, safeties coach, um, when I was in JV, uh, he coached a little bit. Or, uh, yeah, he coached a little bit at UMass. Or no, he played at UMass with Victor Cruz. And I thought that was the sickest thing ever. <laughs> um, and then, you know, he ended up, you know, shining and, going, you know, having pro year and right. whatnot. All right, Jeff, tell – Tell Alex the story because so, so Jeff, you know, so um, most of these guys have been with me for a couple of years now. We do the podcast. I got the website, but when I met Jeff, uh, whatever it is now, a year and a half ago, he's telling me, you know, we're like, you know, you got a player, you, you know, that you like, or what's your, give me, you know, to learn about him. Right. When they come in and he tells me this story about how he met, how he met his wife. And I'm still to this day, like best story ever. Tell him the story. Well, my, my now wife, um, we were only dating for a few months. We weren't dating that long. And it was the giant Super Bowl. Victor Cruz is my favorite player by far. The undrafted Patterson, New Jersey, how he, that preseason game, we're number three against the Jets where he scores yeah. three touchdowns. The whole thing, dude, I fell in love with him just like you did. And so like fought him so close, loved him. My girlfriend, she's half Spanish. She knows the salsa. She knows how pumped up, I guess. Like I'm having a Super Bowl party and there's probably 40 people there. And uh, we were across the room from each other. Victor Cruz scores that touchdown in the Super Bowl. And she just pops up off the couch, looks for me, finds me across the room and starts doing the salsa, like from across the room. And I was like, I love you. <laughs> yeah, like I, was, I was done right there. My friends were like, oh, you're done, man. Like, how do you, you're marrying that one. I'm like, well, Turned out to be true. Now we have two kids and uh, still happily married. So well, Victor Cruz. Lo- love that story. <laughs> may have been the glue. <laughs> because if she had, because if she had there messed that salsa, if she had messed that salsa up, you'd be like, oh no. Yeah. Domino awesome. uh, effect. Hell yeah. All right. let, let me ask you, let me ask you now. So if we're moving, so one, um, my daughter looked at Wake uh, this year. My daughter, um, these guys know my daughter uh, accepted a full ride to Michigan State to play field hockey. And, wow, nice. um, thanks. It, it's, 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 it's been a crazy ride with COVID not being able to get on campus and so forth. But my wife, um, it was a kind of like Armageddon cause they got in the car, they would drive to a campus and they would walk these campuses and nobody would be on there. It was like the walking dead, you know, cause it's empty, right? There's no yeah, one there. It's kind of depressing. Yeah. A hundred percent. But here's the thing. Wake is so beautiful. My wife is sending me photos like crazy. And I go, where are you? Cause like, you know, they're doing a tour with no yeah. one to give them a tour. So they're stopping at yeah. Virginia. They're stopping at ODU, you know, and they're making their way around. She sends me these pictures awake and I'm like, yo, that's, that's the spot right there. And my wife's like, yeah, this is the jam. This is a beautiful place. So, you know, you wound up in a good spot. Not only do you get a great degree, but it's, it's not, it's uh, it's nice on the eyes to be around there. So. I will say this. So we, we're coming, so we're going from Duke, going to, to Wofford, I think. Yeah, we're packing Winston. We're going to go down to Wofford. So I just come from Duke that day. And they were talking. We got there, and he was kind of talking walk-on stuff. And I was just like, that's not really what I'm interested. And we, I go into their Panda Express, and there's kids in there. And it's, like, just, like, dead silent. Every kid is by himself with a laptop, studying, little social, like, no socializing. <laughs> Dude, I was kind of like, yeah. I was like, I was like, dang. And so I knew Wake was a good degree. And when we got on campus, the first thing I saw were kids running. And then I went out to the quad and kids were throwing the football, doing something other than just school. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I can come here and get a good degree, but also, you know, 
have some fun too. Kind of be myself, you know. Yeah, yeah. Have have some fun. Meet some new people. Yeah, no doubt. Um, So. Well, we, you know, we were talking to the guys too about like, you know, like I said, the journey is, is always, you know, like there's no such thing as, as perfection, but you know, there is that striving for perfection along the way, right? Like you always think, okay, if, if I can be perfect, that's the end of the journey, but we know there's really no, there's no perfection. So along the way you're striving for per- perfection on each step along the journey. If I was perfect today, I'll get to the next step. What's it like, and I'll let you guys jump in too. What's it like? You, you, you're an undrafted free agent. The Rams bring you all the way to the final cuts, right? I mean, like, mm-hmm. man, like that's like got to have the, like, what's that experience like? Because one, you're in your, your home state, right? Which has got to be cool. I was um, in my hometown. I was that very facility is a mile and a half from where I was born. Oh, oh wow, dude. Yeah. And you and you go. All, I mean, you probably got girlfriends, ex girlfriends. You got your family. You got <laughs> teachers. You got everybody coming to watch you ball out. You get all the way down to that final cut, and I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. Like, just you know, um, having played, I played college ball, but at a D three level, I couldn't imagine what it would be to play Division one ball and then go to those final cuts in your hometown. Like, what's that kind of like? Because I I couldn't even imagine it. Um, it was frustrating at the time, but looking back, like it was a blessing for sure. Um, what had happened was, so through OTAs, um, I was balling. Like I was, I felt like I was the best shit in my life. I was faster than I'd ever been. I was running by guys, scoring touchdowns. I remember at, Brandon Cooks like had like a calf street his second day OTAs. And I have just got there. I just learned the playbook and coach Yarbs grabs me, throws me in with the twos, and there's these four plays. He already has a script. He says, you're going to run this route, this route, this route, and this route, and these next four plays. And I was like, all right. First play, back of the end zone, Blake Bortles hits me for a touchdown. Like, very first play at the get-go. And I'm thinking, I'm like, dude, here we go. <laughs> and I was feeling, feeling really good. And, and through OTAs, we had one guy pull me aside and told me, because I think I had, like, a little hamstring strain, and I immediately, as an undrafted free agent, whenever you get hurt, your number one thought is, like, I might be screwed. Like, I might be done. Yeah, And so I had one of our guys pull me aside when I had a hamstring strain through the middle of the TAs. He goes, dude, don't worry about that. You're not going anywhere. Like, you're going to be good. Like, just based on how it's playing, he's, like, already making me um, – already kind of jumping forward to the conclusion that, like, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be I'm gonna be there either on the 53 or through cuts – or uh, through practice squad for the season. And so that was kind of reassuring to me. But then I got to camp. And I start feeling this pain in my stomach and I'm fighting through it. We, uh, we go through up to Oakland, play those games and, or go through those practices. And I'm still feeling this, go through the first game. And I come back, I'm like, yo, you guys got to look at this. And so they had brought the word sports hernia. I had no idea what the heck that was. And um, we got an MRI. The team doctor was like, ah, I don't know if I'd operate on it. And so I hit my agent up. I was like, yo, we got to get second opinions. We sent like six doctors. And the head, the main uh, sports training doctor in the world is based in Philadelphia. He operates on everyone's from Justin Verlander to Odell. Kareem Hunt was in the, the operation room right after me. Um, and so after the second game, I couldn't take it anymore. I was running down full speed on kickoff. And feeling this pain. I'm just looking to right at me and one of our linebackers keeping up with me. And I'm like, I can't put this stuff on tape. Um, so after the second game, we played the Cowboys in Hawaii and I was like, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I feel like I, I, when I cough, it would hurt. Like I just got this weird feeling down there. Um, and so I went and I was getting surgery in, in Philly and the doctor came back and told me, he's like, look, I thought your left adductor was attached to your pubic bone, but actually both of your adductors were attached. So both of my groin ligaments were attached from my pubic bone. So I've been dealing with that in the preseason. Um, but it was one of those things where I kind of had to make that decision of do I get surgery now, knowing I'm probably gonna get cut like for sure, you know, or am I gonna try and stick it through, grind it out, make the team have to deal with this either all the season while I, or and risk putting bad tape on film. It was one of those things I had to kind of come to the conclusion to. It ended up working out for me, obviously, because it brought me to New York. Um, and I think it's kind of what needed to happen for me. Um, I think my, my mom always says she, she thinks, didn't think 
the Rams were the right place for me because it was too much in my comfort zone. And you don't okay. grow when you're in your comfort zone. You don't to grow home. in your comfort zone. Really oh, good yeah. point. Yeah. And that's, that's an yeah. interesting perspective to think of it too, as like, I think you said it, said it well, if you're in that position, so many times you just want to stick it out to not miss an opportunity. But then the, the other edge of that sword is putting bad tape on film yeah. or bad tape out there. Right. Um, exactly. So that's, that's a interesting to hear you, hear you talk about that. But my mom just didn't think I was going to grow. Like, you know, you don't grow when you're in your comfort zone. You know, you grow when you're in, put in uncomfortable situations um, where you have to deal with some adversity, you have to man up a little bit, toughen up a little bit. Those are the uh, opportunities for you to grow. I think coming to New York, it was a little bit out of my comfort zone. I think going across the country for college helped prepare me for that. But there's a different type of toughness you have to bring when you get to a city like New York, um, I think. Uh, I, I was just going to ask you about that. Like, yeah. what, you know, A, what's the phone call like? The agent calls you and says, hey, Giants, or what's what's the call like? And then when you get to New York, because, I mean, you're playing in East Rutherford, you might be living on the Jersey side, you know, or, you know, but you're probably in New York on a regular basis, you know, whether you're going to dinner, you're hanging with the guys, like what's that experience like? Cause Jeff, how many times have we talked about like New York's not for everybody? No. And I don't even like it. And it's like 40 minutes <laughs> from me and I've grown up in New Jersey. I'd rather be at the beach. That's, that's just me though. But um, that is interesting. Like what was the, how'd the transition go from you? Was there anybody on the team that you just connected with immediately and just kind of hit it off with? Like, how did that transition go? Funny, so when I got cut from the Rams on my injury settlement, like the Rams still had pretty much rights to me until my injury settlement ended, the Giants called immediately. And they said, and so my agent called me and said, yo, the Giants are trying to pick you up. But I had to tell them that you didn't just get waived. You got waived injured. And so they're like, oh, okay. So that kind of gave me a sense of comments that, hey, at least I know when I'm healthy, I'm still going to have an opportunity to still play this game. Um, I don't think a lot of guys – get injured as undrafted free agents in the middle of preseason and get released and have an opportunity to still continue to play ball. So I was super grateful for that. Um, flew out to New York to work out. Didn't pass the physical. I was still breaking up scar tissue down there. So they immediately flew me back. So in 24 hours, I went to New York and back. You know. Wait, and, uh, what? the next day they brought you back? So they flew me out to New York and I yep. got a physical. They didn't work out. I did the physical and the, the doctor's like, mm, I don't think he's ready. Flew me right back. And so <laughs> oh, they said, shit. they said, they said, come back out. They said, come back out in two weeks. Jesus. And we're we're gonna have you, we're gonna bring you back out in two weeks. Because after your injury settlement ends, I think it's like a three week span that you're a restricted free agent. Every team can grab you except for LA. Okay. So if LA was banking on bringing me back, they're gonna have to wait three weeks. So that first week. You know, they flew, up me, flew me out to New York, and they're like, we'll bring you back in two weeks to work you out. Like, we think we'd be healthy. Then. So uh, they flew me out there the second time. I thought I was going to work out by myself, you know, and I show up, there's like 19 guys there. And I was just like, I was like, Damn. oh, like, okay. Um, so did all the drills, did everything. I honestly didn't feel great in my workout. Didn't feel like I did the best I could, but um, – 18 guys got in the car with their suitcases and went home and they kept me there. And Damn, so dude. that's great. Um, it, it was, it was pretty, pretty cool. And um, I'm super grateful for it, but getting to New York. Um, it's funny. Do you guys follow the bachelor? <laughs> what, what year? <laughs> I didn't see that. Coming. This, this bachelor this year. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't, but a bunch of my friends do. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. Mike, like sure. Mikey, Mike. Fre Mikey <laughs> Fred. Definitely. I'll be so, honest. I, I don't care. So Matt went to Wake. Um, he's the bachelor. Right now. He went to Wake. He lives part of the time in New York. Is an apartment that he shares with another uh, former Wake Forest Stephen Deacon. But um, he's actually the first person to call me when I got my surgery. And um, so you guys are boys. Uh, we've we've definitely gotten closer. I was. It's one. He's one of those guys that's just like you don't have to talk to him very much. But he's like, always there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so he called me and. Um, then later that week when New York called, I, I called him and said, dude, when I come back from injury, I think I might be headed to New York possibly. He's like, dude, sick. Like, Tyler, my roommate's not here. He's gone for like the next six months. You can just live with me. And so I got free Ooh. rent. I got free rent in New York. Um, New York City, lower, lower, lower East Side. Um, dude, you're probably living like a king. He's yeah. probably got a Rolodex of the hottest <laughs> girls in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, think about it. Think was, about, uh, Jeff, think about this. 
He's living in a place that probably costs four thousand dollars a month in in rent. Free. I need friends like this. He's got a dude who's like on the Bachelor. His 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 his, his phone probably has like you but know. But he was not. He was not this time. He was not. This oh, time. true, true. Yeah, yeah. but. The, but the dude's good looking anyway, so he's probably already got himself. Knee, knee he's probably doing it. okay. Yeah, he's yeah, doing he's right. doing okay. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. So far, I'm thinking this journey sounds like a pretty good one to me. Yeah, I'm uh, down. It, it was def- it was definitely nice to come to New York and have somebody like in your comfort zone a little bit, yeah. a little bit of something familiar. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, sure. But the one the one downside was my commute was terrible. I didn't have a car or nothing like, so I you- would take this up. I would take the subway to the wow. transit to Uber to the facility. So I wake up like four thirty in the morning. Fuck. You, do that. You, nobody would nobody would give you a ride or something. <laughs> nah. From Manhattan, no, that's I, a pain I, I, in the I, ass, dude. You gotta get a place in Jersey, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, this year I came back and I stayed at this place called the Av. Uh, you might might have heard of it. How the team stays there? Did you pay by the day instead of by the? The month, okay. you know, or are getting stuck in a six month lease. So if you get cut, you're not paying a six month lease. <laughs> okay. True. You know? So you pay by the day. It's definitely pricey. Um, uh, but, you know, it's give and take. And it's only like 10 minutes from the facility. But when I first got to New York, going back to your question, Caden Smith was a guy I hit it off with. We love Caden um, Smith here. Yeah, we, we're big fans. We, we can't figure out why they don't throw him the rock more. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, um, but he he went to Stanford, and you know, so I'm a West Coast guy, so I have a lot of guys that I know that went to Stanford. So we had mutual friends. Um, so I hung out with him a lot, and then it kind of stunk getting there mid season. Like, he, and when you're in the league, like you know how it works. There's some guys that come in. You might be, if you're already there, you're like, oh, this guy might be here. He might be gone next week. You know, sure. guys are coming in and out constantly. So. Um, there's, getting guys to like invest time in you and spend time with you is, is not easy right when you get there in the middle of the season. Yeah, yeah, because they don't know. Yeah, for sure. So um, it's it took me more towards like the off season. Uh, this last past off season, start to get close to guys. Uh, Saquon was a guy who initially right off the bat, um, we're playing ping pong together. We're as a doubles team, we couldn't be defeated. Um, <laughs> oh. Who who's better? Uh, who's a better ping pong player? You or Saquon? Individually, I take me, but with with the partners together, like we're unbeatable. Golden Tate, though, I'll give him a shout out. He's uh, he's raw. I, I I've he, I've struggled against him every time I play. So <laughs> um, we, we got some we got some, we got some guys though. It stunk this year though because of COVID. They took the ping pong table out of the locker. Room. Oh, come on. My, my boy yeah. went to the to the Junior Olympics in Holland like years ago for ping pong. Really? really? <laughs> a little, I had, long time. I had, I had uh, two sisters. I have a brother. So at, when I was at home growing up, we had a ping pong table. I'd have to prop it up and play by myself. Oh. So I'd just play against myself. Um, Let me and, ask you uh, this. When you yeah. joined, it was, uh, that was the middle of Eli's last year, right? Yes, sir. So like – what 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 had you heard about him like beforehand, and then what what was one of the takeaways after like seeing him? I, I know it was the last half of his last season, but any any takeaways of like things that you had heard before you got there, the perception versus after you spent some time around him? I mean, he's everything I saw on camera, like in interviews and stuff. Just reserved, quiet, real professional. Goes about his business. Uh, yeah. He nicknamed me Cali when I first got there. That's what he called that work. <laughs> I wore Chuck Taylors and he couldn't believe I wore Chuck Taylors. <laughs> He's like, nobody wears Chuck Taylors. And I was like, no, nah, I think they look good. He's like, no, I don't think they look good. <laughs> uh, Listen, I'm, but, I'm, 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 I'm siding with Alex in this one because Eli's not known for his fashion, man. No. So I, 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're rocking Alex, but I'll tell you this. <laughs> I'm probably siding with you, man. Cause I'm, <laughs> I, I don't know about Eli and his fashion, man. I, yeah. You know, Hey, Agreed. If, if you if you believe you got the swag, then you already got the swag. I mean, that's what I think. <laughs> about mentality. So, um, I if I think it looks good, and I think it looks good. But um, I was gonna get, I was actually gonna get him a pair of of Chucks as his <laughs> retirement as his retirement gift, but I wasn't able to pull through on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, my first day, I, I was trying to learn the playbook. I first got there, my goal was to learn the playbook in a week as fast as I could, just give myself an opportunity. Um, you know. To get elevated as a peace squad guy, you know, more goals is trying to get elevated and get back in the roster. So, uh, for me, I felt like 
faster I learned it, the better. So I was, I stayed there. I didn't have a car, so I was going to Uber. Uh, I stayed until like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And by 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, the only other guy there was, was Daniel Jones. And usually until 7.30, Eli was right next to him with him. Um, so it was really cool to see uh, just the time that not only Daniel was investing, but the time that Eli was investing, knowing at the time, too, that Eli was in being selfless and kind of investing in the future of the New York Giants. Yeah. Um, just yeah. being a good teammate. And I, like I said, like, I was coming as undrafted free agent. No one, no one knew who I was, got the midseason. I, got, I tried to be the first one at the facility every day, so I would leave at 4.30. That's and great, man. And I came in, and the only other guy that would be there was either Daniel Jones or Eli. So Eli actually sat down and had breakfast with me, like, the first week I was there. And I was kind of like – I was kind of blown away by it. That's got to be a holy to... holy shit Yeah, moment, you're like right? – yeah. like, That's so okay, cool, yeah. Somehow I went from California to Carolina to New York, and here I am having breakfast with Eli. Hello. Sure. Yeah. It's funny breakfast. you say that, too. I feel like a lot of the comparisons with Eli and Daniel Jones has been like the intangibles, like you said, the work ethic. Um, like behind the scenes, I guess that's pretty accurate then. Like everything that we hear and read about as far as like them being so similar from what they put in, right? For sure. Absolutely. The way that they go about their business, um, they're, profession they're, they're both professionals and they both, you know, they also have a little bit of a fun side to them that, you know, They'll slide on a couple jokes, like like I said with Eli calling me Cali and making fun of me a little bit or whatnot. <laughs> and I, I'll talk trash to Daniel all day about Duke Wake Forest, you know. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, we, his last home game of his college career, we went up there and spanked him on Thanksgiving. Weekend. <laughs> so I'll never let him forget that. Don't um, let him forget. Don't keep him on yeah. his toes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, I was really happy that I got the opportunity. Yeah. One of the things I'll never forget is that on Eli Ren's scout team, you know. So that was another cool thing was rather than just having some, you know, backup quarterback that you're not sure they're going to get an opportunity, I had Eli May and throw me balls the first week I got there. That's true. In practice. Wow. And so my last practice, Eli's last practice of his career, he threw me a touchdown pass. So I can always say. Wow. In his, yeah. in his last practice, I caught a I, touchdown for me. Uh, you know. Yo, that's pretty legit. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I'll never, I'll never forget that for sure, too. Um, but, uh. Let yeah, me, let me he, ask you let it rip too in, in practice. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you this. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the outside noise, like people look in and the perception of this, this year's giants, like looking at the wideouts was, you know, they got to get more separation or, you know, they need more playmakers on the outside. Like you, you see a lot of that. You hear a lot of that as somebody who's inside that room and somebody who knows the X's and O's, right. And like what it's supposed to look like. What would be what would be your quick take on on the Giants' offense this year and like moving forward? What you think as a group of wideouts, you guys can can uh, can 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 accomplish? Um, I think we can accomplish a lot. We do have a lot of talent in the room. Um, one thing we got we got to stay healthy um, for sure. Um, we're young though. I think our offensive line was young. I think at one point we had three rookies starting, um, and it, it all starts up front. So I'm really excited to see those guys continue to develop up front. Yeah, um, I think the know, Giants' offense was like one of the youngest uh, in the league. Fifth, I think our team fifth, in general was one of the youngest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fifth youngest so, in the league, and and really fifth youngest by like a half a year. Like you know, like gold. Uh, nothing against Golden Tate, but Golden Tate's like you know he's got seven years on some of these guys. If you remove Golden Tate from that team, the Giants are the youngest team. It's it's just because Golden Tate's thirty years old or twenty nine years yeah. old. Without Golden Tate, the Giants are, are rocking the youngest team in the, in the league. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I came in, I'm going on, this will be year three now, but our starting running back's younger than me. Saquon, I think he's just turned 24. So I'm a little older than him. Daniel's younger than me. Oh, we had three rookies this year on our offensive line. Mm -hmm. uh, Slay's, Slay's about the same age as me. Chef's two years older than me. So, I mean, um, we, we, are, we are young. And I think not just that, but we also first year with Jason Garrett's system. Um, so a lot right. of, a lot of new, uh, involved. Um, so it definitely takes time, you know, this is a competitive league and, um, I think the biggest thing is it's a team sport. So if you don't have that team aspect to it, it's gonna be hard to win. So, and it takes yeah. time to develop that and develop chemistry. Um, but I'm excited. I believe in coach judges, um, vision for sure. Um, that's, that's a good segue. Make, that's a great yeah. segue. Cause I was going to ask you like, you know, we do this show every week. 
you know, we, we, we talk to a lot of people. Uh, these guys are banging out content all the time and we can see it. We're a little bit like, and I'm a little bit older than these guys too, but the, I'm patient to know there's a lot of development in the process, right? Like, you know, you got guys, all these new guys are new head coach, learning a new system. You got no preseason, you got COVID, you got all these things that you're normally, you trying to take for granted, right? Like, cause, and then you realize you don't have that cohesiveness because everything's new, 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 new. Yeah. But September is like that, a preseason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like you're, you're, you're playing game, game three, like it's a preseason game, but the one constant was judge. What, what did, what did you got? What do you take away from, from judges first year? It seemed like the guys really kind of took to him. Yeah. I mean, we did. He, I, you can tell that he comes from a winning culture for sure. Um, just how he approaches every single day. Um, I don't know how much film he watches. I don't know if he ever goes home. Um, <laughs> he will go, he, 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 uh, cause I was with McVeigh in LA. He has similarities to him with that. And you can tell about his obsession with football. Um, we'll, the day before we play a game, he has the entire previous game this team played like memorized. He'll be like, all right, these are the patterns this team does. Watch, watch what they do on first down, second down, third down. And then he'll go from play one, of their previous game. Like, let's say we're playing um, Cleveland that week. He'll go to Cleveland's previous game, whether Pittsburgh or Cincinnati, whoever they're playing the week before. And we'll watch that entire game the night before. And he's already, already knows the next play, like in his head. Like he's already. That's an obsession right there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. um, So you, and when you see a guy that puts in the work like that, um, you know that, you know, you, you want to win for a guy like that. You want to play for a guy like that. And you want to put in that same work. Um, for me, I'm a guy who prides himself in trying to be the hardest working guy in the room. And that's not just the team that's coaches included. Um, uh, that's just always my mindset. I felt like I'll have no regrets in life. If I approach every day that way, if I approach every day and give sure. the best I got, then, then I'll, I'll be able to look myself in the mirror, win or lose and be like, Hey, I, did, I gave everything I got. I worked the hardest I could. And so I got no regrets. Um, so judge the same way. And he, he approaches every detail. He, he'll, he'll take you out of practice or, you know, or pull you aside to, you know, say, Hey, try this next time or whatever. Um, he is consistently trying to improve his team 1% each guy every single day. And uh, just those details and the way he goes about his business that, um, you know, and it, the, the toughness that he's established that we're not going to be a soft team. New York doesn't pride themselves on being soft. They pride themselves on being tough, you know, going to work, being blue collar. That's the type of, um, team that he wants to bring to him in New York, and yeah, I, think I, I won't be surprised uh, to see us continue. I mean, it's it's little plays. Like I don't know how many plays we were from what we we finished six and ten. Like there was like four or five games that could have gone easily the other way. Yeah, one hundred percent, man. You know, people we, are looking at us completely different. You know, we, I agree. We we beat some of this stuff up to death because. You know, we're lo- we're watching everything you guys do, analyzing. We're watching the all twenty two. We're watching videotape because we're trying to we're trying to, you know, uh, enjoy a winning season too. And we can easily, Jeff. How many times have we talked about that we the Giants lost three games by a total of six points? Like there's a play here and there. Yeah, like you're well, talking about you're talking about a handful of plays each game. You know that you know the team could have been eight and eight easily. Yep. And I think it was like 10 games into the season. We're looking at the schedule and we're like, other than San Fran, you take that game out. We were in every single game in the fourth quarter. And it's like and a couple bounces, yeah. a couple plays, dude. The whole season is yeah. different. And um, I, like, think the, I think the one thing that Judge was also need from us is the belief, too, that when we go out there, that we're not a bad football team. Like we, we need to go out there and, and believe that we're capable of winning games in this league. And so he, he did that. He pulled the schedule up. He's like, you guys look at our schedule. Honestly. He's like, we played Pittsburgh week one. He's like, that was a game that at halftime could have gone either way. We had a 99 yard drive, you know, turned over the ball. Can't do that. And that kind of ended up being the difference in that game. You know, then we go to San Fran. He's like, I'm going to just put out there. We got our asses handed. Like, <laughs> we got spanked. Um, yeah. But, you know, the LA game could have gone either way. Um, yeah, but right there. there T- Tampa Bay, obviously, but I mean, the, the, the two big ones to me were Dallas. Philly and Philly. And, and the Thursday night Philly game. Um, 
Those so are the just ones. Right there, just right there, that's what, four or five games. Like, that's the difference between us being six and ten and ten and six. And, and you mentioned and, those and, that the first Dallas and Philly game. We win those. We're six and oh in the division. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we exactly. went four and two. That, in the that, that, was, that was the other frustrating thing at the end of the season, the whole, you know, thing that happened yep. in yeah. that, that last <laughs> yeah. game of the year. Yeah. Don't even people, like, people, <laughs> people were talking about, like, you know, you know, like, the fans, you know, you, you win more than six games or whatever. I was like, well, the team that's going to the playoffs, we spanked twice, and yeah, we should have. We 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 were the best team in the division. Like, yep. Just just based off, if you watch the games. I don't see how you could watch the games and not think we were the best. At the end of the day, though, we we got to handle business. So, sure. the whole playoff thing, we got to handle business, and um, you know, so what other teams do shouldn't matter. So we should be able to control what we can control and handle business during our sixteen games. And not yeah, have any well, I think. Excuses. Go ahead, Mike. I think you hear a lot about uh, a lot about culture and, and a lot about those things. And I think with a lot of teams, it's really about wins. Like if you win, if you have a winning organization, like the culture is kind of there, but with this team, you saw a one in seven start, a lot of close games. And in years past, we're sitting here, you know, breaking down giants teams that one in seven clearly could have gone one way. So it was definitely impressive uh, for you guys and judge and, and all, all you players that, you guys stuck together and like really believed like despite what the scoreboard was saying, you believed in the process and continued grinding it out and really showed a, a really strong second half of the season. So like that was really impressive and encouraging about this season. Cause I think the, the culture is genuine with this team and, and it wasn't necessarily a situation of like culture being about the wins. It's just about the actual um, like team vibes. Right. For sure. I think sports are heavily built off momentum. So I think once we got like this, that first win under our belt, and then we were able to see, you know, even the games that we lost, like, just kind of look at it and be like, yo, like, there's no way we should lost these games. Uh, I think it established a sense of confidence and pride in our room and uh, ended up, you know, I think Judge said, you know, we're right there. Like, he kept saying, we're right there, guys. Like, you got – just look at this tape. Like, just showing little little things that had nothing to do with the other team but had everything to do with us and what we weren't doing. He's like, if we can fix these problems, we can win. And it was a little bit um, – too little too late, I think, at that point. Obviously, you take away that one seven start completed in the season. But um yeah, you know, we can't we can't start that way. I think it's nice it's nice knowing though that we have what we're capable of and we can take that with us into you know this season with you know the same coaching staff and and uh you know same what? guys. So and, and, and we got you know say says back hopefully he can stay healthy this year. Um you know I'm really excited for him and uh you know I just know he's attacking every every day right now um, to get better and better and get back to help us. And um, so that'll be nice too. Yeah, I can't, the, help, I can't help but think how important the start of the season is too, because you, like you said, once you got a little momentum going, you rip off four wins in a row. We went because of the bye, we went five weeks without a loss. I could tell you that Giants Twitter was on fire because we we're so excited. Yeah. But like getting off to that that good start in the beginning, going. Two and zero, oh, two and one, three and one, something like that in the beginning. I feel like it changes the whole season because you believe you're winners, and it starts to kind of go through the whole locker room, and everyone gets that confidence. Where you start to, in that fourth quarter, you start to feel like we're going to pull it out because we've done it before, as opposed to like how are we going to get this win? It's like I just keep hoping for finally. Like, I mean, we've suffered as Giants fans, except for 2016 where we went 11 and five. It's been a rough decade. So I'm asking you, Alex, please help us get off to a strong start. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. You said a couple times too, like young team, J Jason Garrett, you know, new system. And I think that's huge. I think continuity is something that is, is overlooked a lot. But like you look at Daniel Jones first half of the year versus his second half of the year. And other than the injury, the second half of the year, he was really playing a lot better and looked just way more confident running Jason Garrett's offense and, um, the rookie linemen kind of got their feet under them a little bit. And I just thought it looked a lot, a lot more uh, cohesive toward the end of the year. So I'm really excited to see um, how this progresses into next year. Cause a lot of unfair criticism thrown, I think at, at Daniel this year, you know, you look around the league, you see young quarterbacks backs putting up, put, putting up like all these stats and stuff. And what, what fans don't see that don't really watch the games and don't understand are those little nuances of, like, hey, like, it's a team, right? Like, you got young offensive linemen. You have a new system. You have an offensive coordinator who was a coach for the last decade and wasn't really calling plays. Like, this is new for Jason Garrett. So I think that 
next year, I'm looking forward to this offense proving a lot of the doubters and the critics um, wrong. Right there with you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I got a question on, like, what's, what's, what's it look like for you? I mean, you're on the active roster, right? You're, you're, you're grinding every day at practice, right? You're, uh, the, the, what I thought was cool, the nickname they had for you in camp was the, uh, the rep stealer because did you, you know, know that was your nickname i was, I, was I, I, I but still has got to be up there with that name too he steals, steals around a lot too yep well well wow. these guys these guys know i'm a big sills fan too and i know he's you know he got himself a contract he'll be back congrats by the way to you because i heard yeah, you congrats. Made some deal uh, a couple weeks sure. ago so congratulations Appreciate um it. you know uh, like so I don't know if you know who Paul Dettino is yet, you know, but you know, Paul's like, he's been like basically the, the head beat writer for the giants for like 20 years. And I told him that you were coming on, you know, he's, you know, he's always real good to us. And uh, he goes, Oh yeah. He goes, Alex, he goes, guy had a great camp. I mean, one of the best camps I've seen in years. So you would still step in, lighten it up, making catches and playing. You go from practice squad to active squad. What's 21 look like? Like, what do you got to do? In 21, it's probably the receiver room is going to look different, right? Some guys aren't coming back. You got a draft coming up, and I'm sure they're going to, you know, like, listen, let's call a spade a spade. The New York Giants offense doesn't score enough points. And we, you know, so they're going to be looking for some playmakers. What's it look like for you? Like, because I'm just curious, like, I don't know what your 40 time is. I don't even care, but I know you got good hands. And we have we don't we don't have any like kick returners or punt returners like like is that in play for you at all like what's twenty what's the, what's the twenty one season look like for you? Um, the one of the things on my exit means that Judge definitely said I need to do this off season was get with the punter, um, and work and work on catching punts, catching kickoffs. Uh, he thinks he can use me, um, not only that but on kickoff, um, special teams, and then on the slot work he, he just wants me. He, he talked about those slot machine guys that they just have an act for getting open. They're crafty. Um, I didn't play slot in college. I played outside in college. Outside, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've always been comfortable on the outside with my releases, ring covers, and like that. Slot's a little different. You got to really be able to think on your feet and uh, find those little zones and just be a guy who's consistently reliable. And I think it takes a few years to develop that a little bit. Um you know, Julian Edelman didn't come in the league and, and instantly just be that guy. It took a couple well, years. Well, he was a quarterback at college. He was, he was. You know, um, but I'm saying that a lot of those guys, um, Colby's kind of had to earn his way too. Um, um, but is that a role? Is that a role you see yourself in? Um, not just that. I think I'm a little bit more versatile than those guys because I'm bigger. You know, I, I pride myself on being a guy who's really versatile, a hybrid. I can play inside, outside. Cool. Um, uh, but I am a guy who. I know, I'm going to know every single position on the field, even the tight end spot. Um, you could throw – I mean, if our, if our running back went down, you need – we could need to go empty. I've run, I've run empty in practice as an age. Um, just knowing the, the full concept. Um, but uh, in terms of other guys and what the receiver room is going to look like, like, to be honest, I don't care. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't control that. And so um, I've always just – pride myself on controlling the controllables, doing what I need to do. Um, like you said, I, according to uh, what – I don't really try and pay too much attention to the noise, but, you know, like my agent does, my parents do, and they're like, you know, you're balling, you're having the best camp. Like, you know, everyone's writing about you. And, like, what did that result in? Like, I didn't make their active roster, you know. But So I only can control what I do, what I bring to the table and practice every day um, and how I go about my daily business. I don't control – what the results bring, I will live with those results regardless of, my, like I said, if I get everything I got every single day and, and um, you know, put my mind to improving myself and, and uh, trying to help this team. Um, so I always expect to be a contributor. That's my expectation. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, it's God's plan, not mine. Uh, his plan is greater than mine. So um, I'm – to do every, I'm going to do everything Coach Judge asked me to do this off season. Uh, anything the team asked me to do, I'm going to do the best of my ability to help this team, and uh, whatever comes with it comes with it. Can you can you return kicks or punts? Have you done it high school at Wake at all? Yeah, or I did, I did. We had a we had a really good punter in college. His name was 
uh, Greg Dorch. Um, I think he's with Atlanta right now. A tiny little slot guy. Um, so he was our guy that, that did that. But whenever he was injured, I, I went in for him. It's something I was comfortable doing. I was a ball boy in, in middle school. So I was catching punts for high school punters since I was in like sixth grade. Okay. Uh, reading, reading the ball and being a guy that, you know, giving the ball back to our offense is not going to be ever something you have to worry about with me back there. Um, but uh, I did it in when I was in L.A. Um, okay. It's funny. They, when I was in L.A., they didn't give me any rest in practice. First preseason game. Opening kickoff, a hey, Bachman, <laughs> go back to kick return. No. <laughs> okay, coach. <laughs> That's some of the stuff that you have to deal with as as under the freeze. They'll, they'll throw you into a fire and just see how you kind of deal with it. How did you um, do? I mean, I got the ball on the twenty five yard line. Boom. I, I, he yeah. said, "Go middle." He said, hey, "You he caught said, it." Go, he said, "Just go middle." He said, "Go middle." <laughs> so I, was, I took that ball. I tried to find the littlest gap I could and just you know hit it. Um, so awesome. right. I, I, can you get on the I field am. playing slot outside or returning kicks first? Tw- 21, you got three opportunities, inside, outside, or returning kicks. What What's the most likely? Or what do you want to have happen? I know you're versatile, but, like, when you yeah. look at it, like, do you feel like, hey, man, I really got a shot of returning kicks for this team, or I really got a shot of, of playing, you know, you were saying they want you to learn more slot. Like, what's the best opportunity for you? I know you'll play wherever you want, but is there yeah. one better opportunity right now? I mean, I don't, I guess I don't know because, like I said, we have the draft. I don't know yeah. what our room I just meant like. in general. Uh, yeah. In, gen- yeah. in general. Where I, would, where I would like to be, I'd like to be playing play slot. Being a guy on third down, you go to every single time. Okay. First down. Like, I, think the- I pride myself on being that dependable guy. Um, returning punts, though, like, I think one thing about me with that is I enjoy doing it. There's a lot of guys that, that are back there that, that don't want to be back there. Yeah. Uh, I get that. They don't like it. <laughs> they don't enjoy that, you know? Um, but it's something I like doing. Um, I think I like it because it's difficult. That's one, you know, I like doing the hard things that no one else is willing to do. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I did it in, in uh, preseason. I was back there at Farmer Turner and they, they, you know, like I said, they would throw you back there. They would, they would take away your reps in practice and then throw you back there in the scrimmage, you know, um, just to see how you handle it. Um, but it's something I'm comfortable doing. And like I said, any way I can contribute is what, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I'm asked, what they asked me to do to the best of my ability. Um, but being in that, that slot position would be ideal for me for sure. Yeah. And Hey man, your attitude is great too. Like I, I could just, your energy and like your, your, you could tell like you're, you're, you're a work ethic guy. And, and I'm sure having a head coach with a special teams background, one of the quickest ways to, to, to build a bond with him is make, make those plays fly around on special teams. Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you wanted me to um, punt, like go over Gunner, uh, do you know PB special teams? I think to be honest, I, I felt like I blew up in preseason by those two games that I played. But I made a lot of plays on special teams at Gunner. I made my money at Gunner. Uh, I don't think I lost a rep um, playing Gunner in preseason, even the Vice. Um, so hopeful that preseason goes good. off this year. You that could be a, yeah, a big yeah, ticket for you. Get some yeah. preseason games for guys like you. Like get yeah. out there, show what you can do. I, that was the one thing with with no preseason this year. I think it took some opportunities away from some guys because, like a guy like me, the Giants knew that they could kind of keep me on peace squad and not really have to really worry about anyone picking me up because I hadn't put any film out there in over like a year, and and I had surgery since then. So, yeah, that's um, a good point. You know, so and then a lot of times when the injuries would happen, you know, they're bringing in vets. This year was a little different. They're bringing in. Uh, older guys um so that was one thing i was got guys can kind of get kept on peace squad without having to team not even really worry about them getting picked up because teams were just sticking with what they were comfortable with or in um like people who knew their system and stuff because there was no preseason um uh, it, was, it was a little different this year for sure definitely definitely different than in my first year so, so jeff let, let's give them the bonus question of the number i mean you you're okay. wearing you're wearing eighty, dude. Like <laughs> like like you you gotta. I mean, I'm sure either someone has said it to you, or as a student of the game, you've got some background on it. I mean, you know, in the '80s, it's Phil McConkey, right? Phil McConkey was a Navy pilot. You know, flew helicopters, comes in, catches you know catching balls in the Super Bowl. Dude was like, 
if you look at his background, like he got no offers to play at school. He went and flew helicopters to get into, you know, get into college. I think he played at like a buck 70, right? I was going to say, how big is this guy? I think I'm bigger than Yeah, him. Phil, you know what I mean? Like, Small. and Pataki was a fan favorite because, like, you just couldn't keep him down. And 5'10, he was just, 170. Yeah. Tiny. And, if, and if you, again, and Jeff, if you look at his background, they'll tell you no one offered him anything, right? It was like his dad uh, went to like college with like the Giants, like running backs coach or something, and he begged him to give him a chance or something, right? Then you roll into the big dog and you roll into like, for, for fans, and if you want to get into, like, statistic and stuff, the second best tight end in Giants history is Jeremy Shockey from Miami. He wore 80. You know, he was a huge fan favorite. And then you get, like you said, number number three comes rocking in from UMass Amherst. And then you start looking at this kid like, all right, well, he got thrown off the team. Then he came back. And then, you know, UMass was, like, made him a hero. And then he walks on and you got – um what do you call it? Uh, Rex Ryan talking about how, who's this number three? Coughlin's, <laughs> Coughlin's like smiling. Next thing you know, game one, because he got an injury too. So he got he got put on IR like you. You know, he really didn't have that year of tape because he was on IR. That next season, he comes back rocking the 80. So like 80s, like, and I, and I had this uh, this tweet to Blake Martinez and he was kind enough to, uh, to respond. I said, the New York Giants are the, the land of the linebacker. I'm like, I said, we we are glad to have you here. We love our thumpers, you know, because the Giants have had LT and Banks and Gary Reasons and Pepper Johnson and Antonio Pierce. It's the land of the linebacker, like like decades of linebackers. 80s a number, dude. Like, like I'm rooting for you, man. You know what like, I see? Eight- you know what I see in Alex's future? This is what I see. You see this? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's there's McConkey right in the Super Bowl, right? Yep, at the one, getting tackled at the one, celebrating yep. yet anguish that he didn't get in the end zone. But but he's that a hero. dude, that dude played way above, way above his head, you know. So like, it's a special you know, number. You know, it is it's, a spe- special it's a special number, and it's cool that you got it because, like I said, we're we're just having some fun. We're glad you're hanging out with us. You know, uh, you know, uh, you gave us this time, but like, we're rooting for you, dude. Like, yeah, brother, like, we're rooting for you. That's, you what I, that's, what I was, that's what I was about to say. We have our, our finger on the pulse of Giants fans. We interact with thousands of them every single week and everyone always roots for the undrafted guy, but like, thank you for doing this. Cause now they're going to get to know you too. And I guarantee you have a lot more fans after doing this and we're all rooting for you, man. Like anytime you get on the field, I don't care in what capacity you're going to have a big group of people rooting for you and pulling for you man so best of luck appreciate you guys thank you so much all All right cool good luck brother yeah absolutely let's get it you'll be listening to the giants guys check out alex you know follow him see what he's up to i don't know how active you are on twitter but we're going to tell our folks to follow you anyway um and hey if you got any videos of you working out chuck them up there dude let's see how uh, love to see you grinding it always appreciate you thank you so much All right, man. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Giants, guys. We'll talk soon. We'll bring Alex back.